Good morning. This morning's scripture is found in Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52, on page number 847 on the Bibles underneath your chairs. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloth, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Katie. Well, good morning. Um, my name's Chris. I am one of the pastors here at the church. Uh, most of you guys know me. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know me, I am not the Pastor Chris. Um, he is uh, slightly older and more than slightly taller than I am. Um, but in his absence, it is my pleasure and it's my joy to be able to fill the pulpit. Um, quick story. Uh, a couple months ago, I was, uh, this guy filled out a connection card and turned it in, and just like we ask all of you guys to do every single week. And he had a couple questions on, on the back of it, and, and they pertain to my area of ministry. And so I give this guy a call. And so I call him up, and nothing crazy. I'm just like, hey, this is Pastor Chris from Foothill Church. I uh, just wanted to follow up with you with the questions that you left on the back of your connection card. And before I could even get the thought out of my, out of my mouth, I hear from the other end. This guy just starts, like, screaming. He was so stoked. He's like, hey, what's up, Pastor Chris? Great to hear from you, man. So glad you take time out of your busy schedule. Give me a call. I really appreciate it. And so I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> he, he's thinking I'm the, the, the Pastor Chris, right? And so at the risk of uh, breaking this guy's poor little heart and uh, at the risk of, you know, destroying my own ego, because I was stoked. I'm like, hey, what's up, man? I'm like, we're homies and I don't even know you. And so I, uh, I'm like, hey, bud, um, are, you, are you thinking of the tall guy that gave the sermon or the short guy that gave the announcements? <laughs> and uh, other end of the line, I hear this pause and he's kind of like, oh, man, I guess I was thinking about the, about the tall guy. But you're cool too, man. Don't even worry about it. You're still a homie. And, so uh, while this morning I, I still don't get the privilege of being the tall pastor, Chris, I, uh, I do get to be the one giving the sermon. So um, before I get into the text, I just want to open up with a word of prayer. Um, God, I just thank you so much, Lord, for, for who you are and for what you've done. God, this, this text and, and your, your word as a whole just puts you on display and shows that you are faithful and that, that you are good. And so, God, help me to be faithful in preaching this text. Help me to be wise and, and give us all ears to hear what you would want to say to us through your word, God. We love you, Lord, and we pray this all for your glory and for our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, if you have a Bible, or if you don't have a Bible, uh, we're, in, we're going to be on page 847 on the Bibles in the chairs. It's Mark 10, 46 through 52. Um, if you've been coming to Foothill for any amount of time, this, this passage and what we just heard Katie read to us, it shouldn't necessarily catch us off guard all that much. I mean, it's, it's something great. Jesus heals a blind man. I got to get this out of my way. I'm going to trip. Um, Jesus heals a blind man, and we by no means want to minimize that at all. Um, he did something great and something amazing, but this isn't something we haven't seen before. Um, all throughout Mark, we've been going through the book of Mark here at Foothill Church, and we've seen Jesus do amazing things in healing the blind, giving the deaf the ability to hear, the lame the ability to walk, the mute the ability to speak. And so he does some, some fantastic stuff. And, and just back in, in Mark chapter 8, again, we saw him heal a blind man at Bethsaida. And so while this is great, it shouldn't be anything that, that catches us off guard. And, and, and now what we have to realize, it's, it's not because Mark is writing down every single thing that Jesus did that he put this in here. John says in his account of the gospel in John 21, 25, that if every one of the things that Jesus did were to be written, that the world itself could not contain the books that would have to be written. And so there's got to be deeper meaning. There's got to be more purpose in, in him putting this in his account of the gospel than simply Jesus restoring sight to a man who, who once couldn't see. 
And so I've come to believe that the primary purpose in Mark, including this miracle in his gospel, is to show us as the readers the condition of the human heart apart from God, as well as this man's, how he models the Christian response to Jesus' call. And so although the story here in Mark is most definitely about Jesus healing a man named Bartimaeus of his physical blindness, it is even more so about Jesus heals, healing this man of his spiritual blindness along with everyone who calls upon Jesus. So to view this story as Jesus simply healing man is to fall short of the intention of scripture completely. And we ourselves, by our very nature, we're, we're all both blind and poor as well. We're supposed to read this text and see ourselves, see our own lives in the life of Bartimaeus. We can claim that we have perfect spiritual vision. We can be going through life and, and, and thinking we have, we have everything all figured out, but it's not until we're empowered with the Holy Spirit that, that God removes the spiritual blindness from us and we're able to see Him and we're able to see the things of God clearly and as they are. And now this isn't just a, a hypothetical statement that I'm making. I've, I've seen this in my own life. Um, I, I was raised by uh, uh, my mom, who's a Christian, and just me and my mom growing up. And, and so I had a Christian upbringing. I, I even went to a Christian school for a couple years. I, I went from church to, I went to church from time to time, and, and I had this good upbringing. Um, in fact, in high school, if you would have asked my friends, if you would ask me, I would have told you I was a Christian. They all would have told you I was a Christian. I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, and so in my mind, shoot, that makes me a Christian, right? <laughs> And, but basically, I lived this good moral life, and that was it. I would have told you, yeah, if, if you would have asked me, hey, Chris, what's the condition of your spiritual vision? I'd have been like, 2020, it's perfect, right? I, I see everything just fine. And yet, now as I look back on my life, I, I can tell you that I was blind. I was so blind. It wasn't like I, I didn't love Jesus, I didn't love Jesus at all. I mean, you could, like, I would have said I was a Christian, and yet I didn't love Jesus at all, really. I wasn't repentant in regard to my sin. I mean, I knew there was things that you did and things that you didn't do. And, and yeah, I did some of the things that you weren't supposed to do, but I, I wasn't repentant in regard to my sin. Um, my, my, the hope of my salvation, my, my ticket to heaven, wasn't the work of Jesus on the cross. It was based on my good works outweighing my bad. I, I was living this life of, of like not Christianity, and yet I was wearing the Christian name tag. It wasn't until my, the summer before my sophomore year of college that, that I actually became a Christian. I, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I was at my buddy Ty's house, and it was just this time in my life where everything just seemed to be going nuts around me. Um, the girl I'd been dating for like two years broke up with me. Um, I, I had no clue what I was going to do with my life. I, I didn't know what my major was going to be. And I'm the kind of guy that like loves to have everything planned out. I love schedules. I love being nice and orderly and like having, knowing tomorrow I'm going to do this and 35 years from now, I'm going to do that or whatever. Um, and, and so in this, this point in my life, it just seems like everything around me was, was just crumbling, right? It was, it was crazy. And so I was at my buddy's Ty's house, and we're, at, we're working out in his garage, because in my mind, I'm like, shoot, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, but regardless to where I end up, being buff isn't going to hurt. And so <laughs> we're, uh, we're uh, getting a little ripped over at, at, in his garage or whatever, and I look down on the floor, and there's this note card um, with Matthew 6, 33 written on it. And, and it's, not like, it's not like Ty's house is like uber Christian. I mean, his friends, I mean, his family, they're all Christian. They're great people, love them to death. But it's not like their house is like littered with Bible verses on note cards all over the place or anything like that. Um, but I, I look down and there it is, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first, or, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and, and all these things will be added to you. And so there's this point in my life where I, everything around me, I'm, I'm, I'm seeking after a job. I'm seeking after a major. I was, I was 18 years old and I was seeking after a wife. I mean, that's not responsible. <laughs> and, but I did get married at 21. Woo, woo! <laughs> so, uh, so in that moment, if you would have asked me, I would have told you that, that God was telling me, hey, Chris, you needed to start taking your faith seriously. But that's not at all what was happening. What was happening is, is that God was beginning the process of removing the spiritual blindness from me. And, and he was revealing himself to me. He, he was... He wasn't saying, Chris, you need to start taking your faith seriously. He was giving me faith for the first time. And so here in Mark 10, we, we see Jesus removing the, this, the physical blindness of Bartimaeus, but also the spiritual blindness as well. Um, if you read with me down in verse, uh, chapter 10, verses 46 and 47, 
It says, and they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And so here's Bartimaeus. He's hanging out on the side of the road, and he hears this great crowd coming. And as soon as he figures out that the reason for this crowd is because Jesus of Nazareth is coming, he begins to cry out to him. Um, Now, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how Bartimaeus came to know of who Jesus was, or even more importantly, how he came to know Jesus as the son of David and and knew to to cry out with such a a, a robust cry, as such a theologically accurate statement in calling him the son of David. Um, But it's clear that he had faith in Jesus as the one in which the Old Testament had promised. Don't turn there now, but if you look over in Luke 18, verse 35, it tells us about how Jesus was entering Jericho, and when he was doing so, he healed a blind man there as well. And so it's possible that, that as Jesus was walking, word that he had healed this blind guy at the beginning of Jericho had gotten to the other side of Jericho before he did, and so that's how Bartimaeus knew about him. Or it's also possible that just as people were walking down the street and they were telling stories like the ones we've heard as we've been going through Mark chapters 1 through the beginning of 10 about this man named Jesus who heals the blind and the sick and the lame and the mute and the deaf and does all these amazing things. And so the Bible doesn't say for sure, doesn't say as, tell us exactly how Bartimaeus came to know about Jesus. But what we can discern for sure is that it wasn't because of something that he saw. It wasn't because of something that Bartimaeus saw with his physical eyes that he had this faith in Jesus. I mean, it's clear because he's blind. (laughs) Um, And yet so many of us think that, that if we were to just see God do something great, if God would just allow me to see him, like, I don't know, throw fire down from heaven or something like that, then, then I would be a Christian. Once God shows up, then, then my faith will show up, right? Um, We want to see God heal the blind man. We want to see this guy who we've known maybe for years, who's been deaf, all of a sudden just be able to hear. We want to see that stuff. I mean, let's be real. You can't tell me it wouldn't be awesome if you woke up one morning, hopped out of bed, and and made some breakfast, and all of a sudden Jesus' face popped up on your toast. That'd be legit, right? We'd be taking pictures of that, putting that on Instagram, tweeting that, look at my Jesus toast, right? And yet in the Bible, that's not how faith works. In, in, in Romans 10, verse 17, Paul writes that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. In 2 Corinthians, Paul goes as far as to say that we should live by faith and not by sight. And so in Bartimaeus' life, as well as in our own, faith is never a matter of the eyes, but it is always a matter of the heart. And it's blatantly clear that the words that come from the mouth of this blind man, that he does have true genuine faith in Jesus. As Jesus is is walking by, he shouts out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And this this statement alone is is, is pretty pretty amazing. I mean, coming from the mouth of a blind, poor, most likely uneducated beggar, this is something that we should all take note of. Um, now, I don't know about your interactions with the homeless. Maybe they've been slightly different than mine, but I've, I've never had a homeless person come up to me and ask me for mercy, right? Um, I, I've had people ask me for a ride. I've had them ask me for food or, or maybe money. But, but Bartimaeus, he doesn't ask for any of these things. In fact, in Bartimaeus' initial request isn't even that he recovers his sight, but rather he... He shouts to Jesus as a soldier who has been conquered, shouts to the one who defeated him. Like like a man on his back with his enemy's sword at his throat, he pleads with Jesus, have mercy on me. Mercy by its very definition is compassionate or kindly forbearance shown toward an offender or an enemy. Because he, he rightly understands that he is standing before Jesus, the Messiah, He doesn't simply ask to be healed, but rather he asks for mercy. He basically cries out to Jesus, son of David, don't kill me. Spare me my life. Because he knows that in in relation to Jesus as the son of David, that he is not even worthy of being in his presence. This is another area where, where our view and our understanding of God has gotten completely out of whack. Proverbs 1-7 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But if we're honest, most of us don't really fear God, at least not in the way that we should, right? We don't, we don't view him as, as the Bible portrays him often. Um, and with our culture's portrayal of who Jesus is, I don't know why in the world we would fear him. I mean, who's afraid of a skinny, pale white guy holding like a baby sheep? Like, right? Nobody is. No one's afraid of that guy. And yet when we see God for who the Bible tells us he is, our natural response is awe and reverence. And ultimately, it's a holy fear. Um, Go ahead and turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Um, this is probably one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. It's, it's talking about Jesus, just, just who he is. And it's just so poetic in, in, in the way that it describes him. I'm going to be reading verses 15 through 20. If you don't have a Bible, it should be on the screen behind me. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and invisible, which has happened. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross." (laughs) When, when we stop seeing Jesus as, as only this meek and mild, oftentimes weak character, and we start to view him as the Alpha and the Omega, when we view him as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, when we see him as the Lion of Judah, <laughs> our response to him, our, our worship of him, our faith in him is so much more robust and, and it will cause us to cry out in a similar manner to that of Bartimaeus. In, in, in calling Jesus the son of David, Bartimaeus is making the claim that Jesus is God's chosen one who would save Israel and ultimately redeem all of God's people. And so with this kind of view of Jesus, with an accurate biblical portrayal of who Jesus is, it's easy for us to see why he would also have this vigorous drive, this relentless drive to get to Jesus as well. It's easy for us to see why he didn't simply just give up when, when people stood between him and Jesus. Um, let's read verse, uh, verse 48 of Mark chapter 10. It says, and many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. <laughs> and so check us out. There, there's times in our lives when people are going to rebuke us, or, or we might even be the person giving the rebuke, and rightfully so. I mean, if, if you have a small child and that you see them wandering over towards the oven when you're cooking up some soup and you know, hey, they're gonna touch that stove, you would be foolish to not stop them and to not rebuke them, right? You, to, to allow your child to do that would be ridiculous. And so a rebuke is most definitely in line. Uh, most of you guys know me. Um, I love sports. I love sports. Um, and I can get a little uh, out of hand, a little loco, if I may, um, when it comes to watching sports. Um, I, I went to an Angels game with my home group on Friday night, woo woo, and um, we had a really good time, but on the way home, I basically had zero voice. Tori Hunter, Tori Hunter hit a triple off the wall, and I'm just like, ah, ah, like the whole time for like 15 seconds, and my voice was shot. Um, Saturday night, last night, I went to Travis Townsend's house, and we watched the UFC fight, and I was screaming at the TV as if my voice, had, like, help the outcome of the fight. Um, it, and, and so I just, I get nuts when it comes to sports. Um, my wife, she's a high school basketball coach and she has, uh, she has her team of girls and I go to her games and I love to root them on, right? But there's been times where in games I've been severely rebuked and it's, <laughs> It's, uh, and it's not just by the fans. It's, uh, I, I've been talked to you by the athletic director. He's like, look, Chris, you got heart, man. I love you. You got great heart. Your heart, it's awesome. I love it, but tone it down. You're gonna have to kick you out. Tone down the heart. And, so, there, and then there's other times where I, I've been the, uh, the referees. They've literally blown the whistle, stopped in the middle of the game. They're like, sir, you gotta calm down. Like, this is getting a little ridiculous. And I'm like, what do you mean ridiculous? What are you talking about? And he's like, this is what I'm talking about right here. Exhibit A. <laughs> And then there's other times 
<laughs> where my wife herself, she's like on the other side, just sitting on, this, on the bench, just like, why in the world? Like taking her ring off as if she doesn't know me, putting it in her pocket. Like, good God, stop, knock it off, quit. And, and, and so when this happens, when I'm getting rebuked by multiple angles for the exact same thing, safe to say that these rebukes are probably in order. I probably deserve them and I should probably listen to them, right? But there's gonna be other times when, when we're being rebuked. And, and it's, it's not because we're being rambunctious or anything like that. It's, it's because God is calling us to do something that might go against the grain of our culture. God might be drawing you to himself and you might be hanging out with people that are like, dude, forget that Christianity stuff. They just wanna take away your fun. But regardless to what rebukes you might get, what opposition you might face, what obstacles stand in your way, you should never stop striving and never stop going towards Christ, ever. I mean, let's think about this. Bartimaeus is blind and there is people standing between him and the one who he has come to understand as the one who can not only heal his vision, but also save his soul. And so it only makes sense that he would cry out all the more, as it says in verse 48, that he wouldn't just stop. When there's a block in the way, he wouldn't just stop and give up. He views him the right way. He views him as the Christ. And he understands that as he is the Christ, he must go towards him. Not one single thing should stand between you and the one who can save you. If you are a Christian and there is something standing between you and Jesus, you have no reasonable choice but to cut it out of your life immediately. There's no other reasonable response. If a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Chris, um, Pastor Chris, not Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris was talking about um, how he was talking about sin in, in Mark chapter nine and, and how we should respond to our sin and the severity of getting rid of our sin. The, the passage says that if your hand causes you to sin, what are you supposed to do? Come on, okay, audience participation, you can do this. If your hand causes you to sin, what are you supposed to do? Cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. And now remember, this isn't, Jesus isn't like saying, oh yeah, go home and you know, dismember yourselves. He's, he's, not, he's not saying that, he, but what he is trying to communicate is the severity of eliminating anything that might bet stand between you and him. Anything at all. If your computer is causing you to sin, chuck it. Your soul is not of as much, or your soul is of far greater value than your computer. If, if, if your relationship is causing you to sin, then break it off. Is it going to be hard? Yeah, it's going to be hard, but, but not following after what Christ has called you to, that's got to be of greater value. Whatever it is that stands between the Christian and the Christ must be cast aside. It has got to be cast aside. In the same way, if you're not a Christian, no matter what your situation or your circumstance, I plead with you, cry out to God that he would have mercy on you. God is faithful. He is so faithful to hear your cry. Don't let your sin stop you. Don't let your pride or your ego or the people around you stand in your way. Don't let anything get between, between you and Christ. This is of far greater severity than acceptance or, or, uh, or status. Don't allow anything to stand between you and Jesus. At the same time, Bartim as we see Bartis Bartimaeus, he's, he's crying out to Jesus as Christians. Our lives should be marked by this type of crying out. We should be living lives of constantly and consistently crying out to God. If you recall in Mark chapter 8, uh, 23 through 26, Jesus was healing the blind guy at Bethsaida and, and he touches his eyes and, and he asks him, hey, do you, do you see anything? And the man says, yeah, I see men, but they look like trees walking. Do you guys remember this passage? Does it sound familiar? He says, I see men, but they, they look like trees walking. And so he, he touches his eyes again and, and restores to him his, his sight completely. And so if you guys don't remember, the, the point of this passage was to tell us that, that salvation and sanctification and, and that the cure for spiritual blindness is a process. It's not like a one and done kind of thing. It's a, a lifetime of, of becoming more and more like God. The first of Martin Luther's 95 Theses says that when the Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he called for the entire life of a believer to be one of repentance. If we are to call ourselves Christians, our lives should be marked by our crying out, by our calling out to Jesus, crying out to God in, in repentance, crying out to him for help or for wisdom. And because when we cry out to God, he's faithful to respond. He's always faithful to respond. We, we see this here in, in verse 49. Go ahead and, and follow along with, with me. It says, and Jesus stopped and said, call him. 
And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And so, guys, (laughs) Jesus is so good. He is so good through the noise, through everything going around him with the crowd and everything else. He hears this man calling him. He stops and he tells the disciples, go and reach out to this guy. And so the disciples, they're, they're faithful in doing what God has called them to do. They approach him in this glad and, and, and hopeful manner. Take heart, get up, he's, he's calling you. And so I don't believe that a single word in scripture goes without purpose. Just as the disciples play this small and yet extremely significant role in bringing this man to Jesus, we too as disciples of Jesus play the same role in communicating the message of the gospel of take heart, he is calling you to the people around us as well. And, and this, is, this is no small task that we've been called to as, as followers of Jesus. God's primary way of bringing people to the saving knowledge of himself is through his church. He does it through us. As Stephen said a, a couple weeks ago, I, I, I just seriously, I haven't been able to get this line out of my head. It, it's so good. He, he said that we as the church are the light by which the world will see God. Okay, we as the church are the light by which the world will see God. D.L. Moody said, out of 100 men, one will read the Bible, the other 99 will read the Christian. And so I know that sharing our faith and, and actually being the church outside of these walls can be intimidating. It can be difficult and, and hard at times. But God in his wisdom has chosen you, and for whatever reason, he's, he's chosen me to be the vessel by which he brings the good news of the gospel to the world around us. Check us out. We are plan A, and there is no plan B. We're it. We are what God has chosen to use to bring the saving knowledge of himself to the world. To fail to take this message that God has entrusted each and every one of us as his people with to the world around us is to fall short of the life that God has called each of us to live. So I I wanna encourage you guys, step out of your comfort zone, reach out to the person God might be calling you to reach out to. Um, If Jesus told his disciples to reach out to Bartimaeus, who might God be calling you to reach out to as well? Only God brings about the work of salvation, but he does it through you and I. Finally, uh, verses 50 through 52, we, we see Bartimaeus' response. It says, in throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. And so we see Jesus, he, he calls this man, and without hesitation, Bartimaeus, he, he springs up and comes to Jesus. Jesus restores to him his physical vision, but he also gives him the ability to, to, to see himself and, and the things of God clearly his way. And this man does the only natural thing and begins to follow Jesus. Um, when, when, when God reveals himself to you and he removes the blinders from your eyes, the only natural response is to follow him, to leave everything else behind and chase after him. Um, about four months ago, I was, I was leaving Sandberg Middle School. They had this thing called Christian Club and I used to help out at it. And I was, I was leaving Sandberg and I was coming over to the office over here at Baseline. And I'm driving down Route, uh, or Grand. And as I approach Route 66, there's like tons of traffic and cars are honking their horns and people are yelling and screaming and going nuts and and it was just this crazy situation and I didn't know what was going on I couldn't see it yet but I assumed what any one of us would assume something big's going down and I'm going to be a witness to it all and therefore I'm getting on the news and so I'm, I'm like adjusting my mirror you know making sure my hair is looking fresh making sure my, sure my no mocos or anything like that and I'm getting news ready you know and so um, I, as I'm like waiting, anticipating, I'm like trying to see what the heck is happening. And as I get a little bit closer, I see this guy and he's kind of just wandering around in the middle of the intersection. I'm like, what the heck? And so my natural response is to, you know, join in the rage, right? Get mad with everybody else. Like, hey, what's this clown doing in the middle of the road? Get him out of here, you know? And so I, I'm just like, you know, getting angry at this guy too. And, but right as I, I, I approach the uh, intersection where the intersection's at, the man stops He's not walking around anymore, and he just drops to his knees. And he's just in this really, he puts his head down, and he's just in this really, like, defeated position. And, and it hits me. This guy's not just being dumb. He, this guy's blind. He has no idea where he is, 
and he has no clue of the danger around him. I mean, there's people missing him by just feet, driving in their cars and just screaming at him when his life is in complete danger and, and he might not even know it. And he's just sitting there in the middle of the intersection of Grand and Route 66. And, and so I, the light was red, but I'm just like, forget this. And I look both ways, of course, and drive across the street, pull into the Ralph's parking lot, and I throw my car into park. I didn't even turn my car off. I just started bolting it towards this guy. And I get, I get to the middle of this intersection, and, and he's, just still, he's just still sitting there. And, and I look on the ground, and there's his walking stick. I don't know how I missed that. I don't know how I didn't see his, initially see his walking stick, but it was on the ground. And so I pick it up. I, I, tell him, I, I talk to him and say, hey, I'm here to help you. I, I put his hand on my arm and, and I begin to walk him over to the sidewalk. And, as, and I'm just trying to calm this guy down. He, he's just freaking out. He has no clue where he is. And so I try to get him reorient, reoriented to where he's at. And I'm like, all right, this is Route 66. This is grand. Um, and, and he tells me his name and I end up giving him a ride home or a ride to where he was going. And... Um, and, and it was just this crazy event, this crazy experience that I, I will, I'll probably never forget. Um, now look, I don't tell you this story because I want you guys to walk out of here thinking I'm Mr. Wonderful. Um, I'm definitely not, I'm a dummy. The only reason I was paying so close attention is because I thought I was gonna be on TV. Um, <laughs> but I tell you this because in that moment, God revealed to me the condition of each and every one of our hearts from, apart from him, that we are all very blind. Even if we grasp the concept of, of spiritual blindness in our heads, it by no means means that we un necessarily understand it in our hearts. Um, on, the way, on, on that day, I could have given you tons of scripture. You'd been like, Chris, prove to me that, that uh, we're spiritually blind using the Bible. I'm like, cake, right? Verse, 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 verse. I probably could have given you a whole page. But it wasn't until I had this experience that, that God truly showed me what these verses actually mean. Um, I, I, I knew these verses. I, I felt like I had a good understanding of them. But God that day showed me in a very real and tangible way exactly what these verses are talking about. I, I would have said, yes, apart from Jesus, we are blind. And yet I had no idea the severity of our spiritual blindness. Listen to me, guys. Apart from God removing spiritual blindness from our hearts, we all walk around with this false confidence that we are just fine and we, when the fact of the matter is we are in the middle of the intersection with danger all around us and no clue where we are. It isn't until God breaks us down and brings us to our knees in the middle of our brokenness that we're able to comprehend that we aren't able to see as we once thought and that we are, in fact, living in blindness. And so in light of this passage, God is calling every single person in this room to respond in one way or another. If you're a Christian, maybe God is telling you to get rid of what's standing between you and him. It could be a job. It could be a person. It could be just a sin. Whatever it is, I don't, I don't know. I can't tell you. But, but if, it, if this is how God's talking to you, you know. And so I encourage you, get rid of it. Whatever it is, cut it off immediately. Or maybe God's telling you to, to step up. Take part in, in, in the, what he has called us to do. His, his last words before he ascended to heaven was to go and make disciples. Maybe he's calling you to do that. Saying, you don't have to necessarily go to wherever, but you might want to go across the street. Because um, apart from faith in Jesus, our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, and our family members, they're blind. They're completely blind for the things of God. And so these people that we love, they are the blind man in the middle of the intersection. They are, are the blind man that we read here in this passage. And they're the ones that God is calling us to go and reach out to. Or possibly God is, is simply continuing to reveal to you how the state of spiritual blindness is extremely real and something that should not be taken lightly at all. I can't tell you exactly what God is calling you to do this morning, but whatever it is, I, I encourage you, live out whatever it is. Um, on the other hand, it would be foolish of me to assume that in a group this size, that everyone in here is a Christian. It, that would just be foolish. Um, so if you're not a Christian, you haven't repented of your sin and, and put your faith in Christ alone. That's all it means to be a Christian, that, that you repent of your sin. Basically, you make a 180 degrees to turn. You turn away from your sin and you turn towards Jesus and you put your faith in him. If you've not done that, Maybe Jesus is calling you to himself just as he did Bartimaeus. 
Maybe you're like I was and you've been living this good moral life, maybe even rocking the Christian name tag. But God, now God is revealing to you that although you thought you could once see spiritual things perfectly, you're now coming to understand that, that you were in fact living in blindness. Um, maybe you know that you're not a Christian. And, and prior to walking into this room, you had no intentions of becoming a Christian either. And yet what's been said this morning is making sense. And you're like, man, I, I feel like God has maybe called me to himself. Maybe God is real. If so, I, I plead with you. I beg of you, cry out to Jesus. He will hear your cry and will not turn a deaf ear. He is faithful to save all who call upon his name. So let me close with this. Um, back home in Corona, I have this buddy. And about three weeks ago, he was, um, he was in Vegas for a poker tournament. He's like a big poker dude. And um, he was out there gambling and, and he met a guy at the casino and him and this guy are, are walking down the street and they're about to cross the street. He's about to step off the curb and my friend says that he, he said he felt there, like there was a hand that, that touched him on the shoulder. And so he turns around and there was nobody there though. And so he's like, oh, that's weird, whatever. He turns back around. He's about to step off the curb. The friend he was walking with had already stepped off the curb. And right as he turns back around, car hits the guy at 40 miles an hour and he loses his life. Um, and so my buddy, um, he's, he's having this like crisis basically. He has no idea what's going on. He's not a Christian and, and yet he's saying things like, oh man, like look, God saved my life. God touched me that day. And um, he's posting this stuff all on Facebook. And, and so a bunch of my other non-Christian and yet quasi spiritual friends are, are saying stuff like, oh man, somebody's looking out for you. And Oh, man, God must have big plans for your life. And, and yet, sadly, that's about where the story ends. There, there is no evidence of, of anything happening. This, this guy who saw another human being lose his life right before his eyes is, is going through all this, and yet he doesn't know how to respond to it, and so he resorts back to life as usual. He's, he's still gambling. He's, in fact, this weekend, he's in Vegas again for another poker tournament. He's, he's still gambling and doing all the things that he was doing before this all went down, and there's no evidence of lasting impact of this event happening in his life at all. He is still living life completely blind to the things of God. And so my fear is that there's some of us in this room today who have felt a touch from God, probably not physically, but you feel as though God is calling you to do something. Maybe God is calling you to himself for the very first time, and yet we're naturally prone to, to just go back to life as usual, to ignore what God is doing in our lives and just resort back to, to life as it is. Um, you feel like God is calling you to, to, to something bigger, something greater, and yet we can, like just like my friend back home who had this crazy experience and his life went exactly back to normal, my, my fear is that some of us in this room who have heard from God will walk out of those doors exactly the same way as we came in. Hebrews 3.15 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. Bartimaeus, he, he understood the state of his blindness. He heard the call from Jesus and he responded to it. And his life was forever changed because of it. And not just his, his physical vision, but his spiritual vision as well. He was able to see natural things, but he was also able to see Jesus and the things of God as they are as well. And because of it, he, he became a Christian. He began to follow Jesus. And, and as a Christian, when we die, we will worship Jesus in heaven beside Bartimaeus. How rad is that? I just got goosebumps. <laughs> How rad is that? <laughs> Jesus alone is able to cure our spiritual blindness and save our souls. If you feel God moving in your life, drawing you to himself, don't harden your heart. Don't turn from him but run to him. Throw everything else aside and run to Jesus. Let's pray.